I'm and don't click. forget to share the link through live. Yep, I'm going to do that now. Once I get it. Okay, just checking that we are live streaming. Sure. My computer is struggling this morning. Okay, we're we're on. I'm just going to send around the link. I guess this is why people have whole production teams in the background. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, our uh, our production team is um, on holiday <laughs> permanently, oh. <clears throat> and they also have um, hundreds of thousands of rands worth of uh, hardware. But we make do. Yeah. There we go. Okay, that's all sent. Uh, we've got a few people watching. Um, So we'll uh, start in, in a couple of minutes. Hi everyone, pop your names in there and we can know who you are. Nick, you're gonna, you'll see the YouTube website, right? The YouTube website? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I will, see, I will see the YouTube <laughs> on the interwebs. Okay. Okay. All right, so predestination. Um, you and me and Helen and John so far are, um, are with us. Uh, we'll wait a few more minutes to give other people a chance to join uh, just because it does take some time to find the video. <clears throat> But we will start fairly soon, and if people come late, they can just rewind. That's the beauty of um, yeah. the YouTubes. Hi, Nolan uh, and Tracy, I assume. Hope you guys are well. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, I, I remember Lorraine. I don't know if she's with us, but uh, once she said to me when we did these build up sessions live at church before lockdown. She said, I wish I could stop you and rewind. Well, now you can. That's the, <laughs> the great thing. Your wish has come true. And you can pause just at the part where we make funny faces. Yes, yeah, that, that's the best. And then take a screenshot and share it with all your friends. <laughs> all right, well, we're gonna, um, we're gonna start now. So welcome everyone who's joined us. Great to have you with us. Just to remind you what these build-up sessions, uh, we do them once a month. And the idea is to cover some basic Christian doctrines that we don't necessarily get a chance to cover extensively in our sermons, but which are foundational in order to understand uh, Christian teaching. You know, the Bible does tell us that we've got to move from the milk to the meat and the milk of course is is uh the basics uh, the very basics of of salvation but uh we also have to be built up in the faith and that means uh to to get into the gristle and the meat of theology as well and that uh, engaging with these deeper theologies which are still foundational to christianity it does build us up it, it does mature us and it does change our worldview in how we look at our lives and how we look at the world so these sessions that we do are very important as well um, and so today we're going to be covering the rather uh, controversial doctrine of predestination and uh, it's caused many controversies and fights throughout christian theology uh, but it, it is foundational to our understanding of god and there's really 
Uh, it reminds me, you know, J.I. Packer's book, you know that book, Dylan, Knowing God. Yeah. Uh, for the, any of you out there who haven't read Knowing God by J.I. Packer, I highly recommend it. And he makes the point at the beginning of his book that there is no greater pursuit in life than knowing God. Uh, it, the most important thing to know is the character of God uh, for his creatures. And so predestination, uh, as we'll see, is, is something vital to knowing how God works and who he is. And so Dylan's going to be leading us through that. And then after that, there'll be an opportunity for any questions that uh, you may have. Now, of course, when it comes to predestination, as I've said before, do think of your questions before you ask them. Uh, we, we don't want to be asking questions that are just trying to trip the teachers up. Um, but actually questions that are going to help those watching. And so do uh, ask questions. Feel free to ask uh, thoughtful questions that are going to help us, uh, help those watching. And then Dylan and I will do the best we can to answer those questions. Uh, but we'll start with, with the lecture and then go on to asking any questions that might have popped up in the YouTube feed, which you're free to ask um, anytime as we go and we'll, we'll address them when we get to them. All right, I'm going to pray, and then I'll hand over to you, Dylan. Okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come to you on this, the Lord's Day, and we pray that you will quieten our minds and our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a day where we can just uh, spend time focusing on you. And so we do pray now that you would help us to know you as we cover this doctrine of predestination, we pray that you would give us clarity of thinking, that we can think rationally through it. We pray for Dylan. We ask that you would just give him the words and, and, a, and a supernatural ability to explain these deep truths in a way that makes sense to everyone watching. Uh, we pray for those uh, who are watching that you would just help uh, us to process these things. And Lord, would you use this time to build us up? in the faith and to strengthen us in our knowledge of you and our knowledge of this world and our knowledge of salvation so that we can go out and declare these truths and glorify you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Dylan, over to you. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, you might want to grab your Bibles um, and have them handy because we will do a lot of digging in the scriptures. Um, so have them handy. Nick, between Nick and me, we'll try and put some verses up on screen. Um, um, but yeah, so, so have your Bibles handy. Just go grab them if you if you need them. Nick, I'm just checking the sound is still okay. You, I'm coming yeah. through okay. okay. Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. So predestination, I know it's a hot topic. You know, it really shouldn't be, but it is because it asks really big questions about who God is. Um you know, who, are, who, who we are, I guess, how does God save? And um, um, how does this whole thing work? And then, of course, if it is true, if predestination is true, what does that mean about us? Um, you know, does it turn us into robots? What does that mean about God? Um, what about his fairness and his love, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, I guess my, uh, the main aim of this talk, obviously, is to, teach the biblical doctrine of predestination so that both Nick and I know that everyone in our church has a basic understanding of what the Bible teaches about it. So basically just going to teach you what the Bible says. Um, but at the same time, we want to sort of highlight the good, the goodness of God in predestinating us and in saving us. Um, and so I guess when I think about predestination, what it does, it gives me a lot of comfort and it does scare me a little, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, but that's the same with God. Um, the God of the Bible gives me a lot of comfort because, as we heard today, you know, I belong to the family of Abraham and I've got all of these blessings. But, you know, he's God and he's beyond our control and his ways are not our ways. And so there's just a little twinge of um, you can't take these things for granted. So you might find that today. Um, and that's that's fine. That's that's fine. I thought I'd start off by just reading a quick definition of predestination, and this is taken from the 39 articles. Um, they form um, the Church of England's kind of official doctrinal statements, and um, it's, it's one of my favorite ones. It's quite a helpful one. So um, 
in our prayer books, the blue prayer books, it's at the end, and I'll just read it quickly. Not the whole thing, um, but just some of it to give us to get us going. So it says this. This is Article 17 on uh, predestination and election. It says this: Predestination to life belongs to God's everlasting purpose. By this is meant that before the foundation of the world, it is His unchangeable decree, in accordance with His secret counsel, to deliver from curse and damnation those whom he has chosen in Christ and to bring them by him, that is Christ, to everlasting salvation as vessels of his mercy. And it's got some Bible verses, which we'll go and look at in a short while. Therefore, those on whom such an excellent blessing of God is bestowed are called according to God's purpose by the Holy Spirit working in them in God's good time. Through grace, they obey this calling and are freely justified by God. They become the sons of God by adoption. They are conformed to the image of his only son, Jesus Christ. They lead holy lives that are given to good works, to the glory of God. And at last, by God's mercy, they attain to everlasting bliss. And it goes on to say a few other things. And um, But it's actually quite a lovely quote. And, you know, these were written by the the great theologians and the archbishops um, and the bishops and the leaders of the church back in those days. And it's a, um, it's a real uh, um, definition filled with, with real hope and warmth. But uh, just to say, um, just a quick, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through a history of predestination, but just to let our, everyone know that, you know, <laughs> these questions have been batted around through church history uh, for millennia now. Um, and so if we're asking the questions, I just want to show you that they have been asked and essentially they have been answered or that every generation needs to access them and make them true for themselves. Um, but just quickly, um, when, you, when you, I guess, talk about predestination, the whole idea of free will comes up and you might have heard names like um, um, this person is an Arminian as opposed to a Calvinist. Uh, this person is a Pelagian um, or semi-Pelagian. Uh, but this one is more Lutheran. And so I just want to run through some of those things so people know what's going on. So the first time that free will um, and predestination and the sovereignty of God, they all go together, were really battered around was in the early 400s by Augustine of Hippo, the, um, uh, the great um, bishop and great church leader, in fact. Um, so Augustine of Hippo, was taken on <laughs> by a British monk called Pelagius. Um, and um, they batted it out really concerning the will of man. So who is man? Is he free and able to obey God? If God tells him what to do, can he do that? Can, can he just obey God and do what God wants in and of himself? Or is he helpless and he needs help to get it done? And so um, just to give people context, the thing that kicked that off, um, um, I think it was Augustine's confessions, actually. Um, and Augustine was saying in a prayer, he said to God, um, give what you command and then command what you will. Saying essentially that if God commands something, we need to get something from God to be able to make us do it. And then God can tell us what to do. And then we're able to do it. And Pelagia says, no, 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 that's not, that's a silly way. If God tells you to do something, he's not going to tell you to do something that you can't do. And so there's this whole debate as to um, how able is the human will to actually get the stuff done that God wants. So that's the 400s. Um, by the way, Augustine won that debate. <laughs> Pelagius lost, was declared a heretic. Um, now, okay, okay, so this is church history, and we're not going to declare heretics for people who don't believe in what we say right now. Um, I'm just saying that Augustine won that debate. Okay, so Augustine and Pelagius... Uh, the early 400s was the first time that this started, um, was really debated around. And then um, got to fast forward about a thousand years to the time of Luther and Calvin. And uh, Luther, again, um, well, he was taken on by uh, Erasmus, a, a scholar called Erasmus. He was a Christian humanist scholar. He was the greatest scholar of Europe, the greatest scholar. Um, in fact, Luther himself knew that he owed a huge debt of gratitude to Erasmus. Erasmus is the one that um, found or, or translated the Bible back into Greek, um, the original languages from the Latin. 
Um, and that enabled Luther to understand things like justification and repentance um, because they were corrupted in the Latin, in the, in the, in the Roman Catholic Bible. Anyway, um, but Erasmus was a, a humanist Christian in the, in the humanist tradition. Luther is a, essentially a, bub a biblical fundamentalist, for want of a better word. And, um, and ach, they were just never going to get along. And um, Erasmus saw that Luther was pulling in a direction um, that he didn't appreciate because he, he was also making, um, he was trying to reform the church as well. Although Luther had the ability to get to the heart of it and Erasmus was just um, sort of trying to get them to change the peripheries. And um, anyway, Erasmus wrote a book on the freedom of the will and Luther responded with, well, on the bondage of the will. <laughs> so Luther is like, no, there's no such thing as free will and um, we need to battle this out. Um, just so people know, so here's the, um, here's the book, The Bondage of the Will. It's a, the, the, there's many translations. This is a particularly good one. It's by J.R. Packer and O.R. Johnson. And um, it's actually thoroughly good reading. It's probably one of the most fun theological books I've ever read. And that's because Luther is such a, a great writer. Um, this is what Luther said. This is one of his comments in the book. Um, so who is man, you know, is he able to, does he have a free will, can he obey God? And in fact, just thinking, you know, Erasmus, say, Erasmus's book was on the freedom of the will. And essentially, that's the same thing Pelagius was saying, um, that man is free and able and has the power and innate ability to do the right thing and obey God. And, you know, and so Erasmus was essentially saying the same thing. And Luther's like, well, no, he's not. And so this is what Luther says about man. But the scripture sets before us a man who is not only bound, wretched, captive, sick, and dead, but who adds to this a plague of blindness. And so he thinks that he is at liberty and happy, unshackled, able, in good health, and alive. <laughs> and so you can see quite clearly Luther understands the human um, condition far better than these humanists that want to make man out to be have these great capacities and abilities and 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 when you look at the sweep of scripture um and then you look inside yourself and see who you are you realize that you're actually you're not you don't have a free will as such so but there's something to be discussed about that and then the other battle that um took place was between calvin and um a Dutch theologian called Arminius, although Arminius came slightly after Calvin, but we're still in the middle, of, we're still in the 1500s here. And Calvin, of course, um, wrote very um, well um, and, and, and with insight into the into predestination. In fact, most people, when they think of predestination, they think, oh, that's the Calvinist doctrine. Calvin himself stood firmly in the line with Luther, going all the way back to Augustine. So they drew on Augustine to understand how um, sovereignty of God and uh, free will and how these things operate. Um, and Calvin says this, he says, uh, uh, the grace of God does not just find people, but makes persons fit to be chosen. And so Calvin there is interacting with that idea of foreknowledge that God would foresee those whom would choose him is what most people understand foreknowledge. And I'm going to show you that that's not true. And Calvin says, the grace of God does not just find people, but actually makes people fit to be chosen. That means we get the gift of the Holy Spirit and it's all given by grace. Okay, so those are just the, the, those three. Um, it's Augustine versus Pelagius, Luther versus Erasmus, Calvin versus Arminius. And those are the great... Um, times when uh, the, the great theologians of the church um, debated these issues. And by the way, Augustine, Luther, and Calvin won. <laughs> so if you go read them, um, you, you will, you'll understand. Um, they just give, they give the, the free will guys such a battering. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, actually. But nevertheless. All right. Then just to um, think before we even get into, into predestination, um, this whole thing of free will and, and who are we? Um, look, we've got to realize that um, this thing of free will is, is it's been kicking around since Adam. <laughs> um, you know, Adam wanted a free will. Um, God told him not to do something and he wasn't going to be told what to do. And so he decided 
I'm going to do the wrong thing. And, um, and so right at the start, um, and both Luther and Calvin would say that free, the only thing that free will ever did was cause sin. <laughs> so what is the point of having free will? Um, Adam doesn't want God to set boundaries. He wants to be able to do whatever he wants and whenever he wants so that the freedom of our, our free will, so to speak, are tied very intimately with the fall of Adam, something that Nick, you picked up in the sermon today. And so, you know, it's just a disaster to have that kind of ability if all you're going to do with it is choose to do the wrong thing. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the history of the world, um, every single human being born into the world sins. Every single human being without fail has this innate ability condition, direction, to not do the right thing, but to do the wrong thing. It just comes naturally to us. It's a natural inclination of our heart to do the wrong thing from when we're born. We don't get taught it. We can just do it automatically. And so the great theologians have all seen that. And, um, and that's what they say about free will. Um, just one other thing, though. Um, free will is a particularly modern an appealing mantra to modern man um, and it's actually axiomatic to the whole to the whole of humanity today especially in the west um, you know I am allowed to choose and no one can tell me what to do um, fairness and equality are kind of bedrock worldviews so it's inconceivable to modern man that God would contradict their free will and act in his interests and and, and not theirs um, and so um, no one likes to have, believe that they're in any way that their wills, that they're wanting to achieve stuff and do whatever they want is in any way stopped or conditioned or um, not that we're the captains of our souls. We can decide what we want to do. And all the movies and everyone talking about this, well, that's where they stand. And so you're fighting quite strongly against the modern worldview against freedom of in, in thinking through the, your free will and versus what the Bible says. And basically, but if you look at our own, if you look deeply and you look at man's condition and you see where we live to our own devices, you'll see quickly that our free wills are not what people want to make them out to be. Okay. What I thought we'd do next is just look at the word predestination because it actually does occur in the Bible. Funny enough, not a huge amount. And so let's, let's go through some of those quickly. Um, and the first time we come across it is in, in the New Testament, at least anyway, is in Acts chapter 4. Nick, if you're able to get that up, that'll be fantastic. Um, Acts chapter 4. And um, by the way, the, 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 the English word predestination um, comes from a Greek word, um, prohorizo, um, kind of have the same prefix and suffix. So pre-destination, something that is destined beforehand, okay? Something that is planned before it happens, pre-destination. And the Greek word behind, the English word predestination is, um, we'll get, that's fine, you can leave the Bible verse up, we'll get there now. But is, you're using um, your, your hands, we want to I'm see. I'm using my hands. <laughs> yeah, so people need to see your hands. All right, all right. It's important, the, the visuals. Predestination <laughs> or make Naomi proud. It's like kiddies talk. Okay. Now the Greek word behind predestination is pro horizo. So pro is the Greek word for pre before and horizo. We get the word horizon from horizo horizon. Um, um, but for them, it means a boundary um, or something that has been set up that will happen up until that point. And so there's a, a, a decision beforehand to set a boundary or to let something happen up until that point. Okay, so just mm -hmm. that's the technical term behind predestination. Okay, Nick, sorry to say, but let's let's head off to that. <laughs> Are you sure you're not no, no more no more hand shows? Not, not quite, not for a while. Okay, putting up the right. verse. And um, so we're in Acts chapter four. Um, what's happened is that um, Peter and the apostles have been given um, the talk about the gospel and they were thrown into prison and I think they were beaten 
and they were let loose and, and um, or, or set free by the Sanhedrin and were told, no, you're not allowed to speak anymore. And they said, no, we'd rather talk about, we'd, you can't stop us. We're going to talk about God. And they get back to all the believers and they have this lovely prayer. This is actually a prayer. So it says this, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, that had decided beforehand should happen is one Greek word, proherizo, what you determined, what you predestined. So just look at that. Herod and Pontius Pilate are under the direct control of God. That God, they did, verse 28, what your power, that is God's power, in other words, not their power, and what your will, that is God's will, not their will, had decided beforehand should happen. Now, immediately we get caught into the interplay between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, because Herod and Pontius Pilate are not um, robots. They think it's their will and their power doing these things. <laughs> but it's not. It's God's will and God's power. And he made these things happen. He caused Pontius Pilate to be there. He caused Herod to, to arrest these people. And that's exactly what they're praying in this prayer. They know that it's not these people, but God. Now, what does that do for them? What is this predestination? If God is in control, what does that do for the believers? Well, look at the rest of their prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In other words, they're not scared. Because God is in control, they can ask God to change what's happened and stop this and let them continue to, to preach and to pray. And anyway, it's all in God's plan and God is in control. So it's, there's really no problem. So it gives them boldness and hope and the ability to cry out and ask God to change things because it is under his control. If Pontius Pilate and Herod are not under God's control and they've got pure free will and it happens by pure chance, what is the point of praying to God? Because you can't change anything. Because he can't change anything. And then there's no hope because you never know who's going to kill you. And you don't know what the process or, or what the plan of God is. Does that make sense? So that's the first occurrence of the word predestination. It, it just, But you can see quite clearly the control and the power and the sovereignty of God behind um, what the word means, right? Okay. The next time it happens is in Romans 8, which I think um, everyone knows about. Um, and it occurs twice there. And the next one is Ephesians. So let's, let's then turn over to Romans chapter 8. I'll turn there in my Bibles anyway, in my Bible, um, as I'm sure everyone else is. And um, it starts a very uh, uh, important section in Romans, a very lovely section, a well-known section. Okay, so Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, there's the word, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And you'll pick up um, the article 17 that we read at the start follows that the similar pattern. Um, and so let's just note what is linked to predestination here. Here, predestination operates to bring people into the loving protection of God. God works for the good, all things. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And who are called and who are predestined. And so the love of God and predestination here are linked together. So in other words, if you want to get rid of predestination, you can get rid of the love of God because they're linked together. Predestination saves us because we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
to be made like Jesus. So if you get rid of predestination, you get rid of being made into the image of Jesus. Predestination, of course, is something that has been chosen beforehand. It's exactly what he says. Those whom he called, those whom he knew. Now I'll get into that word because it's a, it's a word that's misunderstood um, a little bit later. Now notice the operating power here is God's power, not our power. By implication, we have no power in and of ourselves to be conformed to be like Jesus. It takes the power of God. It takes God calling. It takes God for knowing. It, get, it takes God to justify. It takes God to glorify. We can't do these things by ourselves. We just don't have the ability or the authority. Even if we wanted to, we can't tell Jesus, hey, make me like you. He'll just look at you. What are you talking about? I will, I will do that, and I will decide who will get to be like me, uh, to be like Jesus. Again, the context of Romans chapter 8, based on what God has done here in this couple of verses we've read, breaks out into one of the most beautiful paeans of praise to God's love and help us anchor our faith and hope firmly in the actions that God takes and the salvation that God has accomplished on our behalf. So everyone knows the rest of that chapter. We are more than conquerors um, in all these things. Um, uh, we are more than conquerors. Okay. So, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's an important aspect. We're not, you know, you've got to link these things together that God predestines, but then it just gives, it opens us up to thank God and to rest securely in his love. I mean, <laughs> for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, etc., nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So predestination and the love of God again are linked together. So the Bible clearly doesn't have an issue with God predestinating people and loving them. In fact, they're linked. In fact, they're so inseparably linked that you actually can't have one without the other if you think about it. Okay, then another important text is the one from Ephesians. Um, and I think that's in Ephesians chapter 1. So let's, let's turn over there. And that's a longer one, but it's an important one. And again, it's interesting that the, the, the uh, term predestination is used in some of the most beautiful passages um, that many Christians love. They're not hidden away out there in some strange parts of the Bible that no one likes to read. They're parts of the scriptures that we love the most in one sense. Okay, so let's read it and see how it goes. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For, now, <laughs> that little word for is important. It means because. So it's going to link every spiritual blessing in Christ with because he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So blessings in Christ is linked directly to his election, to God's electing us before the foundation of the world. Okay. And then it continues in love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So there's that word in love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship. Now look what predestined, predestination does there it makes you a son it adopts you into the family of god so predestination in the bible is not a bad thing it's a really 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 good thing you really want it you really want god to predestine you again this is in accordance with whose with whose will and pleasure is this in an accordance with who decides this in accordance with his pleasure and will Again, it's God's will and God's choice that makes these things happen, not ours. In fact, the Bible nowhere tells us that it's our free will that gets us these things from God, but rather it's God who gives it to us out of his free will, not ours. What happens next? Well, this is to the praise of his glorious grace, which is freely given us in the one he loves. What else do we have? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, 
in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Now notice that. How do we get this stuff? Well, God just gives it to you. Now we all know what, how gifts work. A gift is when you, someone gives you something that you don't deserve and which you, I mean, you may ask for it, but they just give it to you. And the gift here is an unasked for gift in a sense. It's just, well, you know what? Yeah, just have it. I'm just here. Have Jesus. Have everything I can. Just have it. Boom. And it's just a gift. It's a, out of the blue. Yeah, you can have it. Gifts aren't earned. I don't work for it. Then it's not a gift. Then it's a wage. Uh, if I do work and I go to building site and I dig a hole for three uh, for the day uh, or the week, you know, and they pay me, I deserve those wages. But if I don't do any work and the, the boss of the company says, oh, Dylan, um, listen, I've got some money left over here. Have this guy's wages. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. I didn't do anything to deserve it. So great. And that's, of course, what grace means. By the way, so then grace and election and God's choice are all linked together. In other words, salvation and the sovereignty of God are linked together. So you just can't get away from it. It's not just like predestination is one aspect and it doesn't touch on everything. They all fit together. God, as the sovereign God of the universe, decides to whom he will give the gift of salvation and give the gift of Jesus. It's his choice, not ours. And he makes it happen, not us. Okay. Um, let me just see if I've covered all the points there quickly. Oh, one thing is that it's linked to God's wisdom and understanding and will. Um, just uh, with um, in, in verse 8, um, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he put into Christ into, into effect, etc. And so the sovereign choice of God is linked in the scriptures to his love and to his wisdom and understanding and will. And so it's not arbitrary. Basically, what you've got to come to a point where you, either you trust that God is wise and knows what he's doing or you don't. And so predestination is quite a, it's a bit of a touchstone. You know, do you actually trust that God knows what he's doing uh, and that these things are done by his wisdom uh, and that he doesn't have to explain him to us, but do we trust him? In other words, in the same way, like a small child trusting their parent, parents don't have to explain everything to their children, but they know their children trust that their parents are acting in their best interests, which is true. Okay. Um, I think, uh, in fact, there's another predestination text in, um, in, in that first chapter in verse 11. Um, in him, and it just continues like it doesn't stop with Paul, you know, it's just in case you didn't get the point, guys. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So that's how it ends. <laughs> okay. Now, this we here is Paul and the Jewish believers in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of glory. And, and Paul knows, as every Jewish person, person knows, that they were chosen by God. It wasn't them that chose God. It was God that chose them. I mean, you guys, everyone who's listening knows what we've been doing through Genesis. Uh, you know, did Abraham choose God or did God choose Abraham? How did that actually work? Who was the active player? And so basically, when it comes to salvation and God doing stuff in the world, who's the, who's, the, who's the one that makes it happen? Is it us or is it God? Well, always it's God. We are the recipients of his actions, of his choice. The Jews know that. And Paul is saying the same thing. In him, we were also chosen. Now, then he will now include the Gentiles. In other words, you are also going to be chosen, also having been predestined. Um, now, whose plan is it? Ours or God's? Well, it's God's plan. And who's, who's, who's will? Who's, who has the ability? Who has the power to make these things happen? Well, these things work out in the conformity with the purpose of his will, not our will. Okay. Um, so there's the first. So ne the, the, essentially, that's... Um, 
the verses in the New Testament that talk about predestination. I'm just looking at the time, Nick. It's now quarter to 12 already. I can't believe it. Um, before we go to sort of comments and questions then, um, just one thing about this foreknowledge that pops up in the text all the time, especially that Romans 8 one, those whom God foreknew. foreknew. And the options there, what most people say, or um, what many people believe, is that God saw who would choose him who would make the choice to, 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 to want salvation and therefore he chose them based on their choice of him. The word for knowledge doesn't work like that in the Bible. Um, I just did a quick search on um, for knowledge. It's, it's also got only five and we don't have time now to go through them. But the first time it happens is interesting. It's in, in Acts, 20, uh, Acts 26. Um, and it just, it, 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 um, it just says this, um, the Jewish people all knew that, um, this is Paul talking, the Jewish people all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country, or St. Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time. That is, they have foreknown me. They foreknew me. That's the Greek word, foreknow. And they can testify if they're willing that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. Now, what's Paul saying there? He's not saying that they would foreknew that Paul would choose to become a Jew. No, they knew what Paul was already. And every Jew knows that they all have already been chosen. He was. So this foreknowledge of what Paul would choose to do, uh, this is not foreknowledge of what Paul would choose to do, but foreknowledge on what was already chosen for him. And so... Um, that's an important verse. Nick, maybe just um, the, um, everyone knows the Romans 8 ones, but what about um, 1 Peter 1? It's there as well. Um, and so 1 Peter 1. Um, and so let's just look at that and then we'll stop. We'll stop there and take a breather. Um, and this is Peter writing now to God's elect. Notice that. Okay, so who does the electing? It's God. Exiles scattered to the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's, by the way, now us Christians who have been chosen, so that elect people have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Again, foreknowledge cannot mean here the knowledge that God has of those who would choose him because it actually says he knows them those whom he has already chosen. <laughs> so, it's not based on your choosing. God's foreknowledge is based on his choosing. So he chooses and then he knows those whom he has chosen. Essentially, it's like a, it just, it, it, it lets us know that God knows us. Um, and that he, and, and in fact, that he knows us by name. Um, it's, it's because he doesn't just call in general, he calls specific people and specific families and so he chose abraham he doesn't just say hey who would like to join me and then abraham stuck up his hand and then hey god it's me it's me it's me abraham and then god is like who oh abraham okay god looks at the world at abraham's time and says you know what out of all the people in the world i want that guy over there living in number five mud hut street in ur and his name is abraham I want him. And so that's actually a great, um, it's just such a nice thing to know that God knows us and that he's got our names in his mind when he calls us. It's not just like a, hey, who would like to join me? And then you've got to go, yeah, yeah, me, I'd like to join you. Okay, so uh, Nick, um, so there's more, but um, those are the verses that people generally go to. And so hopefully I've, you've seen that a predestination is linked to many of the things that we love as Christians um, and you, they don't just stand alone. And so you, and you don't want one without the other, they all work together. Okay. Um, do you want to uh, look at some questions now? I think so. It's 10 to 12. And so okay. um, if there are any questions cool. or if you want to bat something yeah. around, do that. There's a great, um, there's a great one actually that uh, might just uh, distinguish and give clarity on some of the differences that we want to talk about. So the question is: the words 
foreknew, predestined, chosen, elect, do these all have different meanings? How are they different? And uh, it's a good question because there is a, a slight distinction, isn't there, between uh, being elect and being predestined, especially the different ways that elect is used in the New Testament, which we've covered before months ago. But Dylan, do you maybe just want to uh, talk to that? What is, uh, let's take um, foreknew, predestined, and elect. Because chosen and elect essentially are the same underlying word. They're synonymous, but not necessarily for new predestined and elect. These are slightly different things. Do you just want to talk to that a bit? Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Look, to be honest, for me, they all mean the same thing. <laughs> I mean, I know that they're slightly different. Um, but they're all... Okay, so, so the thing that I'm they happy do to have a crack at it as well. Okay, I'm, I'm, that would be great. But I'll just tell you what they do for me. What they do is that they all tell me that God is the one who controls our salvation. That it's what we get from him is all up to him and all from him and all by him. He elects, he chooses, he foreknows, and he predestines. So all the active, all the action, all the thing making reality happen comes from God and doesn't come from me. I, 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 in one sense, I am a passive in my salvation. I receive what God has decided to give me. Of course, we receive it by faith and repentance. And there are, of course, human actions and interactions. We didn't have the time, but later on you'll realize, actually, my faith comes from God. My repentance comes from God. The Holy Spirit that I need to get these things done comes from God. The change of my heart comes from God. The opening of my eyes comes from God. So, what have I actually done? I've done nothing. Um, I, okay, Nick, but you want to maybe work out the minutia there? Yeah, just uh, there, there's a from from my reading, especially into Augustine and stuff, when I was doing some work on this earlier in the year. Um, what struck me was the interesting um, difference between predestined and election, uh, or or being chosen. Predestined refers to the future, um, whereas election being chosen is in the past tense it's something that god has already done so there is a sense in which the word election or choosing in the bible can refer to people who are chosen but are not predestined judas is a classic example jesus uses the elect language to say i have chosen you when he talks to his disciples including judas he says you i have chosen now for many of them that choosing was also a predestination to a future glory but not for judas in fact, he was predestined uh, to betray Jesus. And so uh, just because someone is chosen to be in faith doesn't mean they're necessarily predestined. This is something we, we chatted about earlier in the year. The fact that uh, someone can have faith and be in the covenant community for a time, but not necessarily be predestined um, till the end. And so that, that draws the distinction, which is a helpful distinction between being chosen also the fact that the covenant community is elect so in ephesians 1 as you've shown us election can refer to a group of people that uh, that group that covenant uh, community uh, is is a chosen group an elect group but and this is the discussion between the visible and the invisible church a subset of that elect group are actually predestined to persevere and so that, that, I think, just draws out the slight distinction between being chosen and being predestined. And, when, and that's why the Bible uses different words for those two things, because they're not exactly the same. And then foreknowledge, you've already, you've already covered, Dylan. Foreknowledge is the prerequisite to predestination. So it's not the same as predestination. It's the thing that leads to and underlies the predestination, uh, okay. the setting of God's love upon particular people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's how it works out in in t time and space. Yeah. Um, and so um, before the foundations of the world, God does the choosing. Um, uh, I guess based on His foreknowledge, that is, it's who He wants to choose, and then He calls them in time and space. So we we hear the actual call of God, and and it's funny. Um, yeah, it it. There are. I don't want to say it's complicated because it's it's not complicated, but it's it's complex. And so there's. You know, there's two callings. There's a general calling, which 
we tell everyone that to repent and come to Christ. And then there's what they call a specific calling. God actually uses the words of the general calling to call specific people to respond. Um, and then um, in that specific calling, he decides that some will stay the course and ultimately be pre and, and be predestined for et eternal life. Um, and so that's the complex thing is we think once you've been called and saved, et cetera, it's, it's once saved, always saved. And the, the, the Bible is not quite, it's not as, as straightforward as that. It's, it's the perseverance of the saints that count. In other words, if you persevere to the end, you will have shown that you were predestined. You can't rest on thinking that you're predestined. And you can live however you like, because we have to take the Bible uh, warnings seriously yeah. about sin and falling away. Related to that, that's helpful. Um, and that's, that's a good thing, because um, one of the things that has come up multiple times in my experience is that the, the doctrine of predestination seems to negate all the warnings to the elect in Scripture to not fall away. And you think, well, if we're predestined, we can't fall away. So what's the point of the warnings? And then, of course, the, the classic answer is... Um, well, the warnings are the means by which God causes his elect to persevere. But um, there's one thing that o Augustine says, and he makes the point, and this is related to a next question that comes up, and I'll quote Augustine now, but um, the question is, so someone can be elect in the present, but not have eternal life in the future. In other words, can someone be elect, but not predestined, or not, or can someone be elect and still at the risk of falling away um it's a good question and the answer um must be based on the fact that remember election has a few different meanings it can be it can be referred to those who have been elected to be part of the covenant community for time that's how jesus uses the word elect or chosen with judas he says i've elected you i've chosen you even though he doesn't last it can refer to the entire church the the covenant community um, the family of Abraham, that that's an elect family, but you can fall out of that family due to lack of faith. As I've used the lifeboat illustration before, um, where we are pulled into the lifeboat, we are saved, but we must make sure we don't fall out of the lifeboat before it reaches the shore. That lifeboat is the elect lifeboat. And so often the language of election in scripture refers to the lifeboat rather than the particular individuals in the lifeboat even though sometimes when, it, when it's talking about predestination, it's referring to those particular individuals that are predestined. But Augustine says that we shouldn't presume to think we know who are the predestined individuals. So I'll just quote from him. Hmm. Augustine says, um, it says this, such things as these are so spoken to saints who will persevere as if it were reckoned uncertain if they will persevere, since it is well for them not to be high-minded, but to fear. For who of the multitude of believers can presume so long as he is living in this mortal state that he is in the number of the predestined? Because it is necessary that in this condition uh, that should be kept hidden since here we have to be aware of so much pride. And so he makes the point that if we presume, even just because we're in the boat, just because we're in the elect people, that um, we are definitely predestined, that means we will actually not take the warnings seriously. And so in answer to the question, can someone be elect and not have eternal life? All I want to do is quote two verses. Um, the first is 2 Timothy 2.10, which says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So Paul, in his mind, sees the elect has already been elected. They're already elect, and they, he can tell them, you are elect. In fact, Peter and Paul, they quite clearly tell people you are elect, but they never say you are predestined. Very interesting. And in fact, um, Paul says, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may too obtain the salvation in the future. So he still is working and giving his life so that the elect in the present may obtain future salvation. Now, Paul wouldn't talk that way if he saw predestination and election as exactly the same things. Another verse that addresses that question, um, the distinction between election and predestination, is 2 Peter 1, 10 to 11, where Peter says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. 
Uh, for if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom. And so Peter's saying, you guys have been elect. In fact, he opens his letter by saying, you're elect. You're in the elect people. You're in Israel. But now confirm your election. Make sure that you endure by using the means of grace that God has made available. And so I, I think hopefully that helps just draw out the distinction between election and being part of the elect people and making sure that we confirm our calling and election uh, and that we endure everything so that those elect might attain to salvation. That, that's the way that the, the apostles put it, even though it makes it more complicated now in our minds. We have to be true to what the biblical text says. Yeah. Dylan, so, okay. anything on that? Yeah, that's, that's helpful, Nick. Although, as you said, it makes it a little bit more complex. But um, yeah. But if the you Bible think has a way of making things more complex. Yeah, there's more. There's always, always more. Right. Just and the thing is, is, sorry, just on that, before you carry on, what we want to do is we want everything to work in our minds. And so what, what we tend to do is ignore some of Scripture so that it all fits nicely in a neat system. But that's not being true to the Bible. Being true to the Bible is actually doing this and actually working through and saying, well, yes, it does say that the predestined can never fall away. And yet it also warns us not to fall away. So we've got to hold both those things up. And we've got to actually let both of those things speak to us instead of choosing one or the other okay so that's a very important point so that when we we all know we've got our pet theologies and we all know that we've picked up how we believe about these things from what we've been taught and then we obviously and then we throw our own little mix into it and we think this is it you know what we've got to do with our theology our own personal what we think is the what the bible says is it must we must let it be shaped by what the Bible actually says, so that when you come across verses that contradict or challenge or shape or shift something in your thinking, go with what the Bible says, and no matter how difficult it is in your thinking, and no matter what you've got to jettison, the scriptures are the word of God. Yeah. They are truth incarnate. Uh, well, they're truth. Jesus is truth incarnate, but we've got an amazing ability to think bad things and wrong things and faulty things. Let the Bible tell you what you need to believe and shift your theology, your framework, according to what the Bible says. Um, one thing about election and falling away, um, we shouldn't actually be surprised that that is the case because we've got the whole Old Testament to, to show us what an elect people, how an elect people can fall away. Look at, look at the story, what we've done in Genesis so far. Yes, God chose Abraham. And he said, your family is going to be blessed. Did God choose every single individual that has come out of Abraham's loins to be receive his blessings? No, he did not choose Ishmael. And in fact, God, as you've pointed out, as we've constantly pointed out, it's always the surprising people who get God's blessing. So Ishmael didn't get it. Isaac got it. Uh, Esau didn't get it. Jacob got it. And then uh, out of J uh, J uh, Jacob's 12 sons, um, in the blessings in the end of Genesis, Judah and uh, Joseph get the bulk. There's a few others, but a lot of them didn't get it at all. And then you look at Israel's history and God is like, well, yes, I've chosen you, but you know what? I'm going to unchoose you now because you're wasting my time. However, there's always a remnant. God doesn't unchoose the whole people. And so every Jew knows that there's, although they've been chosen, there are people inside Israel who are actually elect for salvation until the end, who will really receive the inherited promises. And so there's a double choosing to take into account when it comes to being chosen by God, which when I, when I first heard that, that kind of flipped my brain a bit, yeah. but it makes sense yeah. of the biblical account. But also the other thing, another way of putting that, um, which is how the New Testament develops the identity of Israel, is that it says not all Israel are true Israel, Paul says yeah. in Romans. And so that, and not all children of Abraham are true children of Abraham. As we saw this morning in the sermon, yeah. the children of Abraham actually are those who have the faith of Abraham. Yeah. And so... And um, thank goodness, because that, that makes space for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the rest of the Gentiles in the world. Um, uh, just going back, because uh, it relates also to what you were saying, on we must make sure we actually read the Bible properly to get these things, instead of, you know, latch onto particular verses and construct a theology that that makes us comfortable or suits us based on those particular verses. This is a classic example. Ephesians 1 that you spoke about earlier is a classic example of reading the Bible properly. And so what 
people gen, ten, generally tend to do in Ephesians 1 is they read Ephesians 1, 3. Uh, Blessed is God the Father, uh, for he chose us, for, for, for in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons. Now we're going, yeah, yes, awesome. And then we think, okay, so who's, who's he talking about? It must be those who are reading um read these words anybody who's reading these words must be predestined because it says us but okay it must be the ephesians right um the ephesian christians that uh, so paul's saying all the ephesian christians who are hearing these words now are predestined and, and so when we read it we immediately apply that to our ourselves individually i am um chosen i am holy and blameless i am predestined by reading this but actually then we read on if we read it in context which hopefully we've been teaching people how to do <laughs> in verse 13 paul says in him you also oh wait a minute so all of those first 12 verses weren't talking about the ephesians at all and not talking about us directly at all wow okay that's what happens when i read the bible in its context i realize that what paul's saying and these verses that i've been pinning my presumption on don't really apply directly to me at all. They apply to who? The Jews, the, 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 the family of Abraham. But then he goes on in the rest of Ephesians to show how the Ephesian Gentiles can now be part of that elect nation as well. So I think Ephesians 1 is a great example of how if we don't read the Bible in context and the way it's been presented, we can form uh, these distorted views and presumptuous views, which Augustine warned us against right? Yeah. Anything yeah. you want to say on that? Yeah, and um, yeah, so um, I think it's Calvin and Luther, in fact, make the same point. Calvin, better than Luther, on these, um, he calls them idle and naughty questions, I think, um, where we're trying to delve into the secret uh, counsel of God, um, and then this whole thing of presumption, oh, I've been chosen, my, my um, uh, and then the non sequiturs, I can, I can live like a life, like I, I like there's nothing you can do to, you know people say there's nothing you can do to make God love you less and there's nothing you can do to make God love you more uh, I don't know I think that's putting God to the test to be perfectly honest um, and so there's a it should humble us hugely to know that God has chosen us um, but we can't presume that me Dylan I'm going to make it to the end now that I've been, that God has put me into his covenant yeah. people. So um, now I just want to I, just chat about that okay. because that raises some questions. Um, so I'll just say what I've, funny enough, I've started, I came across this prayer in the prayer book in one of the colleagues where, it, it got, where the prayer is, um, Lord, um, please keep on giving me faith so that I may um, persevere to the end, you know, words of that effect. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting prayer. I don't think I've ever prayed for God to keep me a Christian. Uh, you know, keep me having faith, keep giving me his Holy Spirit, keep giving me grace, keep giving me the, 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 to, to, the, the ability to trust and believe that the word of God is the word of God and God is who he says he is. And so I find that I'm actually, I'm praying that a lot more um, over the last while um, because I thought, well, actually, you know, maybe I, I, I have taken these things for granted and one shouldn't because it's, or that God starts it and he keeps you in it all the way up until the end and you want to stay up until the end and so you need what you had from the start you need all the way if I can put it like that mm, mm, exactly so um we've got another question but before we we ask that question I just want to uh reiterate what you're saying as well using the illustration that I've used over and over and over again but I think it really helps at least it's helping my mind to understand these differences between election and predestination and that is the lifeboat illustration that we have been chosen to be pulled into this lifeboat the covenant people and that covenant people Israel the children of Abraham true children of Abraham that lifeboat is predestined to reach the shore nothing can, will stop it from reaching the shore and much of the language of election and predestination talk about that being the vehicle of salvation that God has chosen much like the ark saved Noah's family. So the church, the, the lifeboat, in fact, that's in the baptism liturgy that we use when we baptize the people that, that you've entered into the ark, you've entered into the chosen vessel of salvation, the elect vessel of salvation. Um, now, the reason I want to also uh, reiterate this illustration is because 
I think a, a, a question that might be coming in people's minds that are watching this and, and often uh, will come when people understand this biblical teaching of predestination election is, well, where's my assurance then? Suddenly my assurance has disappeared because my assurance used to be pinned on the fact that I was predestined. But now if you're saying, you know, I've got to make sure I, well, Paul's saying, I've got to um, work out my salvation with fear and trembling and make my calling and election sure. And Peter's saying, to the elect you must do these things if you don't want to fall away we're going oh where's my assurance my assurance is is in the fact that i've been pulled into the life that i've been chosen by god i believe and he has given me within his people within his life but he has given me all the means of salvation that i need to stay saved not by any work of my own but by his grace alone and so i've been pulled into this life but i'm sitting at the bottom of this life but i'm dripping um, I've been, I'm thankful and so comforted that I've been pulled out of the, the, the water of sin and death. And I look around and I see that there's rations and there's supplies and there's safety lines in the lifeboat. There's everything God has provided me to make sure that I stay here in the lifeboat and reach the shore one day. And so I would be foolish now to go and play on the edge of the lifeboat and not use what God has given me. And I think that's what you're saying, that just because we're in the life, but it doesn't mean we must presume and not use what God has given us to grow and stay in the elect people. Uh, and that's, I think, what all the warnings in Scripture are there for. It's saying, make sure you work out your, your salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure you take being in the elect people seriously. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so for me personally, just because I know there's a danger that I might fall out doesn't undermine or take away my comfort and my assurance because i know god has given me everything i need and as long as i take hold of the means he's given me i won't fall away yeah yeah okay that's good nick that analogy is helpful um for a number of reasons um also tied to that is the is is the point that god is the one who does the rescuing Yes. Uh, so I can rest assured in that God has done the work of my salvation for me. I, the, I can't make it happen. And so that takes a huge weight of my inabilities, my insecurities, my, uh, well, that's it, basically, inabilities mm. and insecurities. Um, I can't make it happen. I can't twist God's arm. I can't undo what I've done in my life. I can't, I can't, I can't take back what I've done and what I've said. I can't undo the hurt. Well, one can in Christ and, and forgiveness and, and, and make up amends, but you can't actually physically undo the historical event that happened. And only God is able to do the forgiveness there. And so salvation is God doing the work of saving and rescuing and pulling us in. Obviously, with regards to predestination and election, everyone, there's that whole thing of, yes, God may, God reaches down, you know, there's God's hand, and then your hand must reach up, and it's my free will. That's me grabbing onto the salvation that God is offering. And it's a misunderstanding of basically our problem and how salvation works. So God isn't, uh, I, I think of a, a rescue mission in a helicopter. He's flying above, and he's looking into, into, and he's like, hey, guys, I'm here to save you. And then everyone is fighting in the water. And this one raises his hand. He's okay, well, let's go save the one that just raised his hand. That's not how rescue works. Rescue works. The guy comes in. He says, okay, whoa, whoa, they're all drowned. They're all drowning. But you see, here's that other thing is how dead are we? Mm. When God saves us, are we sort of okay? And we can say, hey, oh, yeah, just come get me. Or are we dead? You know, are mm. we floating corpses? And we've already drowned. We've sunk to the bottom of the ocean. The fish have been feeding on us. And the only thing that can bring us back to life is if someone does CPR and knits and, and gets oxygen back to our brains. And so we, we, you know, we're unconscious and dead. And so the way that the Bible talks about salvation is to bring us back to life, not here I am, choose me. So the language of how we talk about salvation helps us understand predestination. So very often people talk about you must make a choice because it's all about relationship with God. No, you're not alive. And God is your friend. You're dead. God has to make you alive. Yeah. And he's the only one that can do it. And that's, that's, how, that's how the process of getting in the boat works. It's not my yeah. hand reaching his. It's his hand pushing, doing CPR on my chest, putting me over his shoulder and dumping me in the boat. And now in the yeah. boat, I'm awake for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, that doesn't undermine and negate, the, for example, the evangelist's place to say, come to Christ. Because Jesus himself says, come to me all you are weary and burdened. 
but it's not that's not saying that it's within the human's ability to choose what that's saying is it's calling god's elect out of the world and god will then cause them to believe not they choose to believe you don't wake up one morning and say i think i'm going to believe in jesus now it's something that god gives you and that's what causes a person to respond to the gospel yeah. and to repent and believe Okay, that's a great point, because that's another um, confusion that people have is if there's predestination works, why must I evangelize? Because God is going to save them anyway. Yeah. Well, again, that point about not knowing who God is going to save, but we do know how God saves. And God has told us how he saves. It's by my word. So go and tell people my word so that my Holy Spirit can go and do the work that I want them to do. Because if they don't hear, how can they be saved? So that's Romans 10. Um, that's actually a very important uh, aspect of, of how God saves. So we, we don't know who he's going to save, but we know that he is going to save, and yeah. we know how he's going to save by the preaching of the word. That's all we and need I guess, to um, And I guess that that also applies to us. We've been uh, elected then, maybe not predestined at the final yet, but we, um, we also we can't be a this is a difficult one but we can't be a absolutely 100 percent sure that i'm going to make it because i haven't made it yet the only way we know that something is going to happen is if it happens <laughs> and it hasn't happened yet and so i can't presume on reaching there i've got to stay within the bounds of what god has told me to do once i'm in the lifeboat if that makes sense yeah. if we could presume that then and a large percentage of the New Testament that warns us to make use of God's means would be pointless because we could just sit back and enjoy the, the ride. But as Augustine rightly says, we can't presume that. But what we can know and draw comfort from is the fact that we are in the elect people and that God has given us everything we need. Um, as long as we make use of his means of salvation, which we will do if he's predestined us anyway, then we can be assured of our future hope and our future salvation. It's not, it's not something we have to wonder about. And that's the, that's the mind-blowing thing, that God has made it so that we must, make, we must um, be vigilant and we must fight the good fight of faith. And yet that doesn't undermine the great assurance we have in our future. It almost seems to be two truths that don't uh, work together, and yet they're both, they're both true. Yeah. Um, we have one more question and then um while you think about the answer to this question which you're going to answer before we finish hopefully i'm going to also say a few more things uh, just on what you were saying and evangelism and predestination and the interplay between the two of them the question the last question is why would god love some and not others i thought god loved all of the creation he has made so while you noodle that around i'm gonna also just comment on my experience of evangelism and predestination. And, uh, you know, one of the things, the wrong ways to think about predestination is, oh, well, I don't need to go and evangelize them because God's going to save who he's going to save. Um, but one of the verses that I keep coming back to uh, is John uh, 6. I just want to find it quickly. John 6, verse 37. Um, I'm actually going to, maybe I'll put it up for everyone, because this is a it's, a, it's a very important verse when it comes to evangelism. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me share that now. John 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So here you've got the two aspects of predestination and election coming together. The one is that God has elected who's going to come to Jesus. And everyone that the Father has elected will come to Jesus will come to him. He, of course, will use the means of the proclamation of the gospel to bring them to Jesus. Because they can't come to Jesus without knowing him and hearing him first. But then the next part of the verse says, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And so what that means is that election doesn't mean that um it's impossible for you to come to jesus so that's one of the objections often that election means that um 
God's made it impossible for Bob or, or Susan to actually come to Jesus at all. But this is whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. In other words, election doesn't stop um, the fact that, or it doesn't undermine the fact that if you come to Jesus and you put your faith in him, he will not cast you out. Um, th so there's that security there that if you come to Jesus, he's not going to say, well, yeah, I know, I know you want to come. I know you've seen that I'm the Messiah, but sorry, I'm looking on my list and you're not predestined. So off you go. It doesn't work that way. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So if you are watching this, maybe, and you're, um, you're wondering whether you're predestined, Jesus has an assurance to say to you, he will not cast you out if you come to him. That if you, if you come to him and look to him and put your faith in him, you can be sure that you are part of his people. And, and again, this seems to contradict what we've been saying, and yet it's, it's there in scripture. It's, it's true in the Bible. Um, so predestination, true as it is, doesn't undermine the fact that we can be confident in our salvation. I think that's one of the things yeah. I want to reiterate. So Dylan, um, why would God love some and not others? I thought God loved all the creation that he had made. A nice cracker for you to end on. Okay. Um, Going to take a deep breath. <laughs> this may shock you. God does not love everyone. Okay, now okay. can you elaborate a little bit on that? We think God loves everyone, and we've been told again and again, God loves everyone. A link to that is that God has made a way of salvation, that he's made salvation a potential thing for you to have. All you have to do is make a choice and a decision and a commitment, and you've got to reach out your hand of faith. Salvation doesn't work like that, and God's love doesn't work like that. So when we say, when the Bible talks about the love of God, it does sometimes, on the very rare occasion, say that God is benevolent towards all mankind. He makes the rain fall on the righteous and the wicked. He makes the sun shine everywhere. Everyone understands that. What that means, though, it's not that God loves them, but he's the control and owner of the whole of the created universe, whether you acknowledge it or not. Nevertheless. The love of God is not his general feeling. So that's a, <laughs> the other thing about when we talk about love, we, we have a very Hollywood, gushy, mm. God loves everyone and just love. It's like a so nice towards everyone, just nice, a big hug, a cosmic hug, whatever you want to call it. But the love of God, technically speaking in the scriptures, is linked to his salvation and his acts of saving his people. So if... If you want to ask, how do you know that God loves me? Well, God must have done something to show you that he loves you. Otherwise, how can you say that he loves you? In the, but, but think about human relationships. It's the same way with marriage. You, 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 you know that your partner loves you when they do nice things for you and, are, and, and say nice things and are beneficial towards you. You know, I, um, I, the, the vast majority of people out there don't love me. They don't even know me. They have done nothing for me. So how can I say that they love me? So link, don't link love to feeling, but live, link love to action. And when you link it to action, then the love of God is shown to us in Jesus Christ, not in I love everyone and I've made a way of salvation possible. No, I have actually taken active steps on behalf of certain people to make sure that their sins are forgiven. So think about Christ and his forgiveness on the cross. Think, think of what he's done on the cross. Did, when we say that your sins have been forgiven, or, or if we say that Jesus died for our, our sins, are your sins actually paid for or are they potentially paid for? But also think through the steps of salvation. What else do you need? You don't just need your sins forgiven. You need the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's not a potential gift. It's an actual gift. The Holy Spirit actually has to come into your heart. You also need to be raised again from the dead. That's not a potential resurrection. You actually have to be raised again from the dead in order to receive the blessings of God. And so the love of God is shown in the things that he does for his people. It's not just a broadcast love of feeling yep. of gentleness. Now, just uh, two, two things, Nick, just on that, because it's an important point, although mm. people are, are going to go. 
John 3.16 is the most misunderstood verse in the Bible. Everyone okay. reads John 3.16. It says, for God loved the world so much that he sent his only son. That is not what the Greek means. And it's a, it's a normal English translation, but our English has shifted. It's not an indication of how much God loves everyone. The world there is not every individual. God loves the world in this way. It's an indication of what he does, of how he loves. It's like when you, how have you done something? I've done it like so. It's an indication of the way that he does it. It's in Jesus Christ. Um, and so uh, that's not an indication of how much, although obviously it's a lot of love, but it's not loving everyone in the world. It's loving people in Christ. And then the last thing to say that God doesn't actually love everyone. He loves his people. Um, you just got to read Romans chapter nine. Um, so I was struggling yeah. with this back in the day um, because I was taught free will. Mm. I was taught God loves everyone. And then, you know, I was reading the Bible or I was put, questions were put to me. Yes, uh, it kept me awake at night for some, some time. Sorry about the light. The sun has come up. So I'm a bit yeah, I've got it as well. Um, I'm just going to read from Romans 9. It's just now, if, if, if uh, one thing to do, maybe just to leave people, go read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Um, these things, you know, that's as clear as daylight. You just have to, what we said, you've got to shift, you let the Bible shift your theology. And if you've got questions, you know, obviously come back to us. But um, talking about election, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I wonder if we should because it covers this whole thing. I'm just going to read, uh, let me just read the parts that are important. Verse 14. Uh, no. Verse 10. He's, he's asking the question, has God's word failed to his people? He says, no, not actually, because we all know how God works. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac, something we, we'd spoken about earlier. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So, you know, God doesn't love Esau. He loves Jacob. And who decided that? Well, God decided that. What then shall we say? Oh, no, that doesn't sound fair. Paul says, well, is God unjust? No, not at all. Because he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Okay, what that means is he, that's that active thing about God. He actually has mercy. He actually has compassion on whom he decides, and then they receive it. It does not, therefore, depend on man's desire effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Yeah. Now, of course, that opens up a huge bunch of can of worms. But the answer to the question, does God love everyone? Is obviously no. And who does he love and, and how does he love? He loves by saving people. That's great. Thanks, Dylan. And the fact is that the Bible also said God hates certain people. He hates those who are swift to shed blood. There's a, there's a lot of God setting his anger and, and hatred and not love. So this whole universe that God loves everyone is not biblical if we take if we read the Bible in context, if we read it in its whole and take all of those together. Um, we don't have any more time, uh, but okay. we've addressed all the questions. So well done, Dylan. Um, what I do want to do, though, is for those who maybe this idea of God not loving everyone um, is new. Uh, I do also want to direct you to um, R.C. Sproul. He's a great reformed teacher, and he addressed this question as well. Uh, and you can find it here. I'm just going to share the screen uh, on the Ligonia Ministry website. He also addresses this question, is it biblical to say that God loves everyone? And of course, comes to the same con biblical conclusion that we've outlined here. And there's a little video you can watch. I'm going to put that uh, in the description of this, vid of this uh, video in our YouTube channel, so you can go watch that at your leisure. Um, but thank you, Dylan, uh, for all that work. I think that was very helpful. Um, and a, a lot for people to now go and process uh, in their heads. But uh, great to know that God's sovereignty um, has underpinned his salvation, that we who are in his people need not doubt his ability to cause us to reach 
um, his hope uh, one day. Uh, and, and, but we must take seriously uh, the means of salvation and perseverance that he's given us to do that. So thanks, Dylan. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who may have joined late, you can go back and watch this video from the beginning if you want. It will be available on our YouTube channel after the fact for you to go watch at your leisure. Um, but I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for your immense and complete sovereignty over the affairs of this world, even over salvation. We thank you that it is not up to us in any means, in any way, um, to save ourselves by our own works or our own um, working stuff out. But you choose who's going to believe. You choose who's going to come to you. Lord, I, I thank you that you've done that because it takes away the um, the burden of us to think that we have to save ourselves. Um, Lord, thank you that um, even though we were dead in our transgressions, you made us alive uh, and you brought us into your people. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to uh, now make our calling and election sure, as your word tells us to do. Help us to embrace and take seriously the position that you've put us in as members of your covenant people, the family of Abraham, and that we will use all the means that you have made freely available to us through your son and through your spirit and through your church to work out our salvation and to represent you to this world and to live our lives in light of the hope that you have secured for us. And so we pray that you'll be with us and strengthen us in this as we fight the fight of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks, Dylan. And goodbye, everyone. And enjoy the rest of the Lord's Day together.